I would like to start with the warm front first. And I would like to see if you guys know anything about the warm front. Um, so oh now if you look at the image that you have in front of you and the document that you receive somewhere, there should be a warm front, an image of a warm front. But here you have it in front of you. So we're going to the right hand side. So if you look at the the line that we have for a warm front is a diagonal line that is being drawn from the ground up towards the sky. So and we can see that there is a red arrow that points to us that warm air is rising from that warm front. Now what I want you to concentrate on if you go to the bottom of that picture, you will see that there is a red line with half moons, half circles uh, drawn on that line. That is what an image will look like of a warm front on your synoptic weather map. Remember, you will get a black and white map, so that won't the color won't show to you, but you need to know the differences between a warm front and a cold front if you get your synoptic weather map in the exams. But I want you to go to the front of the warm front. That will be on your right hand side. We have temperatures of 19 degrees Celsius and 17 degrees Celsius. Now, if you notice those two weather stations, that is weather stations, they are further away from the warm front. But if you look at the one closer to the warm front, still in the front of the warm front, that is temperature for that weather station is 20 degrees Celsius. But now the warm front is coming closer to him. But let's see what is happening behind the warm front. Now behind the warm front, we have higher temperatures. 24 degrees Celsius is a 26 and we have a 28. So that means that the warm front has already passed over those weather stations. So what will the temperature be? What will the weather conditions be behind a warm front? So you need to know the following. If a warm front moves or a front moves over an area, then you should know the, the following. following. Is it what is the temperature like? What is the pressure like? What kind of clouds will we get? Is there going to be rainfall? And then the wind direction you also need to know. OK, that is a warm front, ladies and gentlemen. But now let's look what does a cold front do? Because that is now the picture on the left hand side. Now the weather station behind a cold front. is a difference between the two. OK, now the warm front is a diagonal line. But just look at the cold front line. That is a curved line or a convex line, okay? And it's got a very steep gradient. So, ladies and gentlemen, in the exams, when they ask you to draw a cold front, then that is what you should do. That image that you see on the top with the arrow behind the cold front that say cold air, that is what you need to draw. You need to also add in the warm air that is rising because that cold air is catching up with the warm air. But now come, let's look at the weather stations in front of the cold front. That is now on the right hand side. That's in front of the cold front. 27, 28, 24. Now the 27 and 28 degrees Celsius that we have, those are temperatures that is that is weather stations that's still in the distance from the cold front, but the cold front is coming closer and closer. So watch the 24 degrees Celsius. Now the cold front is already almost on that weather station. Just see how the temperature has changed. But now let's go behind the cold front. Can we see that the temperatures has now dropped totally? We have a 18, we have a 16 degrees Celsius. So and a 14 degrees Celsius. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that will be asked from you uh, a cold front. I've, I've noticed over the year that most of the examiners tend to ask about the cold front and no, not about the warm front. So let's concentrate. I mean, I'm not saying that you should not give attention to the warm front, but that is the one. The cold front is always the one that is asked. So you need to know the kind of clouds, and I hope that you know that the clouds. Oh, no. the... Do I have someone speaking? <laughs> OK, so you need to know, ladies and gentlemen, you need to know, or boys and girls, you need to know what is the kind of clouds that we will get 
and that is what that clouds that we have there on, on with the cold front is cumulus nimbus clouds. Remember the steep gradient, remember convex, that is your drawing, you should have that curve to show that this is a cold front. Okay, okay. ladies and gentlemen, so we now we go to the next slide. So, ladies and gentlemen, there we have, a, 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 before we get to Mr. the Silver. Mr. Silver. Yes, the learn. Can we ask Jamie Lee to mute her mic? Because from our side, we can't mute her. Jamie Lee. Okay, Dylan, can I continue? Yes, so you can continue. Okay. Um, I still have two things for me. Dylan, I'm going to be back switch off his mic. <laughs> Dylan, can you hear me, Dylan? I can hear you, sir. Um, we are just struggling a little bit with muting that person's mic. Doesn't okay. want to go, but I'm trying to solve it. Okay. There we go, so you can go on. Sorry oh. for that. All right, thank you, Dylan. All right, sorry there, boys and girls. Okay, let's go to you. So you need to know what is the weather conditions that we will find after a warm front or cold front has moved over an area. That's important, okay? So now let's go to the next one, ladies and gentlemen. That is a mid-latitude cyclone, ladies and gentlemen. So two fronts that we find there. Now you need to know with a mid-latitude cyclone, you need to know the characteristics of a mid-latitude cyclone, you need to know what is a mid-latitude cyclone. You need to wait, know where we do find it. When does it appear? Why does it appear in that time of the year? And what is the weather conditions that come with the mid-latitude cyclone? And then eventually we need to know what is the impact it has on the humans or the environment. So ladies and gentlemen, so there we have a mid-latitude cyclone and we have two sections there we have first we have the warm front in front right on the right hand side so the warm front will always appear first then we have the cold front that will follow now we will see that we have a warm front with a warm sector now the warm sector is the part between the two fronts so the question we can ask is what is the weather conditions behind a warm front then you go into the warm sector. So if we look at the characteristics, we will say a mid-latitude cyclone has got a warm front, it's got a cold front, it's got a warm sector. So that's the three parts we need to know. You need to describe where is the warm sector. Then we look at on the outside, we have the cold sector. So what is the weather conditions behind the cold front? So you will say that is cold conditions, maybe wet conditions, uh, wind, uh, gust winds or winds will increase and some uh, stuff like that. But also I want to point out to you, look at the circular, circular movement that we have. Right, that is the wind direction that we have in and you will see that the wind direction changes. Every time if we go to the different sectors, as we go um, around that low pressure, we see that the wind direction change. Now that is known as backing. 
that means the wind direction is changing into a different direction. Now, backing in the southern hemisphere, don't forget that, backing in southern hemisphere, but veering in the northern hemisphere. Okay, so also the L will indicate to us that that is a low pressure. Now, we also has the isobars. Now you can say it's oval shape or you can say circular sh shape of the of, of the isobars. And then I want to point to you uh, the thousand. That's the uh, isobar that's on the outside. Now, how do we know that this is a low pressure? The isobar will decrease as we move to the inside. And that is why we have the L that gives us an indication that that is a low pressure. Now, boys and girls, with the mid latitude cyclone, remember now that what you have learned is that the cold front is more dense. It's got heavier air, that air moves faster. So it will catch up with the warm front. Next, catch up with the warm front, it will dive, or what we say, it will wedge under the warm front and it will lift the warm front from the surface of the earth. And that can push the warm front, that cold air that dives under that warm front can push that air up into the atmosphere. And we know as air rises, warm air rises, it cools down, right? And then condensation happens and then clouds will form and later on we will have rain, okay? Now, ladies and gentlemen, and then the cold front continues, and then we have what is the weather conditions behind a cold front. Right, now, the characteristics include them. You need to say no, that there is a low pressure cell. That it is a low pressure cell, that is your mid-latitude cyclone. It's got both a cold front and a warm front, and the front is separated by two air masses with different temperatures. Remember, a cold front has got cold air, a warm front has got warm air, and the density also um, differs from the, the, the two. Now, ladies and gentlemen, because we have a difference in density and we have a difference in temperature, these two guys won't mix with each other. Come together, and then because the cold air is, or the cold front is, heavier and denser, he will dive under the warm air, okay? Now, you also need to know what is it called a mid-latitude cyclone? It's got different names. So, if it's asked from you in the exam, give synonyms for it. It's also known as a mid-latitude depression, a subtropical cyclone, a frontal depression, or a temperate cyclone, okay? That is what you need to know, ladies and gentlemen. And then we go further. Now, don't forget, circular movement of the air is clockwise in the southern hemisphere, okay? Then we have the warm sector and we have the cold sector behind the warm cold front and it is in front of the warm front we have it. I want you to notice also how the wind direction in each part plays a role. Okay, now, ladies and gentlemen, where do we find mid-latitude cyclones? We find mid-latitude cyclones in the northern hemisphere and we find them in the southern hemisphere. Now, we find them between the 30 degrees to 60 degrees south of the equator or 30 to 60 degrees north of the equator. Now, they move, important, the movement is important, they move from west to east, okay? Now, the question that was posted to me once, now, sir, do we do they only see them during winter time? Ladies and gentlemen, we only see them in the Western Cape during the winter time. So let me rather say they're more prominent in the winter time in the Western Cape. They are there. They flow past our country south, they go past our country during the summertime, but they only have an impact on our weather when it is winter time. 
Okay, so they are, why are they moving from west to east? Because they are found in the mid latitudes or we say in the westerlies. So the western winds are driving them from west to east. Okay, and then they sometimes move and I want to go to the next slide. The one in the center, the family of cyclones. When do we call them a family of cyclones? They are called the family of cyclones when they are linked together. Okay, so the one come and go and then the next one follow and the next one follow and so on. Now, the one that is furthest to the southeast, that one will be the oldest. Then, we have the one that follows him. That one will be number, but will be the middle, middle brother. And then the one that is on the western side of South Africa, that one will be now the little, little brother. So we, they are following each other. Now, ladies and gentlemen, now you need to know also the different stages of development. So we first have the initial stage. Now, in some of the books, Remember when teachers uh, compile their notes, they use different books. In some of the books, they will say initial de slash development stage. In this case, what we have here is the initial stage. Now, what is happening at the initial stage? Now, what we have there is warm air that's moving from west to east, and then we have cold air that's moving. In that. I'm, talking, I'm talking about that first window now in front of you. OK, and then you have a cold air that's moving from east to west. Now, the top part, that warm air that moves from west to east, that's the westerlies. OK, and then we have the bottom part, that's the uh, polar, polar easterlies. OK, now in between, there's a line, a darker line. That is the polar front. Now, what is a front? A front is a separation between two air masses. So there you have in the upper part, you have warm air, you have on the bottom part, you have cold air, and they are separated by the polar front. So air comes from the polar regions, from the uh, polar high pressure area, and it comes from the subtropical uh, high pressure area and then the two air masses meet, meet each other at the polar front. And then, ladies and gentlemen, nothing happens between the two. They move past each other, actually greeting each other as they go past each other. Hi, how are you doing? Where are you going? No, I'm on my way to the Easterlies and you are on my way to the Westerlies. But then something happens. Now I'm going to picture number two. Window number two, the development stage. Friction happened. Where does the friction come from? I don't know, ladies and gentlemen. Let's say right. One of them started to move a little faster than the other one. And that caused a little friction between the two. And then disturbance, because the friction caused a disturbance between the two. And that is where we suddenly see that we form that, that we form, we'll see that we form that wave movement. So there you see that now suddenly they start to get into each other's hair, right? And then the final stage, we have the mature stage. Now, a low pressure cell will start to form, right? In there, where the two lines come together, the warm front and the cold front come to the you know, earth, earth, earth circulation will be clockwise in the southern hemisphere. And that you can see, look at the arrows, show us that it's cir the circular movement is clockwise. And that, that will cause the polar front to break up. And eventually we will have a cold front. You can see a definite cold front and we can see a different moon front. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you need to know this. This is a plan view of a mid-latitude cyclone. And then you need to know also a cross section of a mid-latitude cyclone. So then 
And then you need to know if you if it's in the exam to you, then you need to understand that you need to label them also. You need to get, be exact to say there's the warm front, there is the warm sector, there's the warm air, there's the cold air. We want to see the low pressure that you indicate. Um, and we want to see, OK, that's that's the um, isobars. Still remember what is the isobar? Indicate pressure on a map. So all places that where that same isobar is going through, that those places will have the same um, air pressure of atmospheric pressure. We want to see that also, ladies and gentlemen, and then the air movement, of course. And then we have the last stage, and that is the occlusion occlusion stage. Now, ladies and gentlemen, an occlusion that happens when the cold front catches up with the warm front. Now, remember what I said to you? Different temperatures, different densities. They don't mix. So when the cold front catches up with the warm front, a wedge, that's the word we use, wedge. Okay, some of us say it dives. It dives under the warm front and it pushes the warm front up into the atmosphere. Okay, lift the warm front away from the surface of the earth. And then we get clouds that will be formed. And usually, ladies and gentlemen, we will have a number of stratus clouds that will be formed. And then we have also that intense, we have a very intense low pressure. Okay, now that means that our pressure gradient will be very great. So our isobars will be very close, closely spaced together. And when we have that steep, steep pressure gradient, then it means the wind will blow very, very fast, very slow, high speed winds. Now, when the cold front meet the warm front in a case like that, then it pushes the warm front up into the atmosphere, up into the sky. And then we have cumulus nimbus clouds. And if you know your cumulus nimbus clouds, usually goes with thunderstorms. For that. OK, and then remember now, when your isobars are close together, the wind will be very strong. OK, very, very close, packed together. When your isobars are further apart, so the further it moves away from the from each other, then the wind speed won't be that great. So you will have less wind speed from that side. Okay. So ladies and gentlemen, that is what I have from my side. Um, what you guys have in front of you after what I've shared with you, the one thing that you need to know is that when a cold front, there's a difference in weather conditions. When a cold front moves over an area and when a high uh, um, sorry, a cold front moves over an area and a warm front moves over an area. Okay? And also you need to know what clouds will form also after that. OK, then ladies and gentlemen, now we also want to know what's the impact? What impact does it have on people, on the env environment that we have? OK, so ladies and gentlemen, we can see, we can, we can go into different um, ways to look at it and we can say on the environment and people. So for a farmer, in some cases, a farmer will appreciate a mid-latitude cyclone because a mid-latitude cyclone brings lots of rain in the winter over the western, western Cape. So what does farmers do? They bowl dams so they, they catch the water for the drier season. So when the summertime comes, when the farmer has enough water to make sure that he can water his plants, his uh, lands, uh, cultivated land. So that is actually the purpose why the, uh, farmers bowl dams. OK, so brings the mid latitude brings lots of rain uh, to winter months in the Western Cape. And then um, with that, we can say it's a steep gradient and the steep gradient brings very strong winds, violent storms, and that can also cause property damage to a lot of us. We know, especially the people that lives close to the coastal uh, coastal lines, they are always asked to be, uh, take precaution 
So people move away or put uh, sand bags so that water doesn't come into your property. Um, we advise people not to go to the beach because um, the coastline will be flooded with, with water. Um, also, uh, cumulus nimbus clouds uh, brings thunderstorms, very heavy rain, very heavy, uh, strong winds, so we don't want to be outside. I remember a couple of years ago, not so about two or three years ago, um, there was a weather warning where they said that there's a, a cold front going to move in. Some of the schools closed for a day or two. Um, some children were sending messages to the teachers, I'll oh, school there tomorrow. I said, oh, no, my child, come to school. You're safe here at school. But that is what a, a mid-latitude cyclone can be. So it can have its positive. Like for a farmer, it can be positive. He can catch lots of rain during winter, the winter months that he can use during summer. What about tourism? We know we have a little dorpy not too far here from us, a little town that is called Cirrus. And during the winter months, then Cirrus gets snow. What do we do that stays in Cape Town? We parents get into the cars, take with their children, and we're like, let's go watch what is happening with the snow in Cirrus. But now, what is people bringing to Sierras? Now people that's coming there, they want to stay overnight. The children enjoy that. Now they spend money. Now businesses are making money. So they has a positive influence on tourism for, for areas that get snow. So people stay over, but it can also disrupt communications because we know with those strong winds, lots of rain, flooding, that can cause a problem to us. Your shipping and aviation could not continue. And no, we cannot do any outdoor activities. That is where the children want to be outside, but uh -uh, stay inside today. Well, we can get a gentle rainfall depending on what the cold front is bringing. So if we say if the pressure gradient is very steep, we can expect, right, clouds will come in because there's a wind will move into it. And then we can say, right, now it's going to rain. Um, I said that farmers enjoy it. Then, ladies and gentlemen, also, not only on the coastline, if we look deeper into the Western Cape, now we go into inland, now we can look at um, France, oh, that's got the mountain pass. We can look at Bain's Clough as we go to Sierras. Those passes can be closed because, listen, we don't want people to drive along areas where there can be rock falls. Remember grade 11 um, geography? Uh, I don't think it was in there, but we somewhere we did rock falls. But why does rock falls occur? It's because lots of water that falls or rain falls on the mountains and then that uh, uh, slopes become, become so soggy and then eventually that will also make sure that it falls down and we don't want to have that. I want you to answer those questions for me and then I'm going to give you I'll give you about, let's say about eight minutes to answer those questions. All right, time's up. All right, grade 12. If you had to answer 1.4.1, give evidence that show that A, that is a cross section of a cold front. So what evidence will you provide to say to us that that is a cold front. So your answer should include the following. Did you see the kind of line we have? Could you identify the kind of air we have? Could you identify the cloud, kind of clouds we have? Because that is how the evidence that we would like to see. We ask this question to you in the exams. This is the evidence that we would like to see. You need to say if it is a cold front because it, or a warm front, because if you look at the kind of line that we have, remember the curve line or the convex line, that tells us if what kind of front it is. Now, your answer should include the following, and here it comes. The shape of the front is a convex. So that we say it's convex, and that gives us an indicator, indication that it is, or we know that it is a cold front. Also, if you look at the air, 
behind the fold front is cold air, so that already has given you the idea that that is a cold front. The gradient of the front, starting very steep at the bottom, right, convex, we go to contours that appear there, convex and concave, so this is a convex shape, so it's starting very steep at the bottom, and then it pans out to become gentle at the top, okay? But we want to see that you can identify it's got a steep gradient that is convex. Then clouds. One moment, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, clouds. You could identify cumulus nimbus clouds. Remember that comes with thunderstorms. Okay. Heavy rain. Then cold air behind the cold front. Okay. Why do cumulus numbers clouds develop along the front at A? Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, see, take that one away. So cold air undercuts the warm air. That is why we have cumulus numbers clouds. Okay. What did I say to you? Warm air and cold air does not mix, but cold air dives under the warm air. Warm air forces it up, it forces the, uh, the warm air is forced to rise very high into the atmosphere or into the sky. And also large scale condensation will happen. Steep gradient cause rapid strong uplift of air. So any of those you can answer on the fast. Okay, in 1.3, once the cold front passes over, an area, the air pressure will increase. Explain why this is the case. So, by now you should know that when we have warm air or on a warm day, that's warm. warm air, we know that that warm air will rise. Okay, but what is created at the bottom? I always explain it to the learners in that way. What if that air disappear from the surface of the earth? There's no more air there on a warm day. Then we have what we call a low pressure. But now we say, yeah, a cold front passes over. Now a cold front brings in air. So the air will increase. So we'll explain what is the what will happen. So cold air drops the temperature behind the cold front and cold air is heavier. So it forces down on the surface of the earth. I want to go lay down. So I bring all my clouds, all my troubles, and we go lay down and we press down on the earth. So that makes it a high pressure. So the pressure will increase. Okay. Then question 1.44. With the reference to the diagram in 1.4, write the paragraph of approximately eight line in which you explain the development of a cold front. Ladies and gentlemen, the words say explain. So you can't just say this cold air behind the cold front. Where does it come from? What what is the conditions of a, of that air behind the cold front? Okay. Um, you say cold air moves faster. OK, that's fine. But faster than what? It needs to be. You need to say it moves faster than warm air. So air behind the cold front is colder than the air in front. Cold air moves faster than warm air. And the cold front will catch up with the warm front. And then will meet at the apex. Remember the apex is the short distance between the two fronts. Okay, and then the cold fronts undercut, wedge, dive under the warm front, and then we have a warm sector that will be lifted from the surface of the earth. So you need to explain, ladies and gentlemen, you can't just say there's cold air behind the cold front. And colder and then you need to explain so that we understand that you know what you're talking about okay then ladies and gentlemen the next one
right. Here we have cross sections of in, that will be on your page five. OK, now when you draw these um, cross sections or this illus illustrations, ladies and gentlemen, the two that I have picked up that they always uh, ask in the exams is the cold front and the cold front occlusion. OK, now occlusion is that last stage of a mid latitude cyclone. OK, when the two air masses, now they're coming close together, that is the occlusion where the cold front dives under the warm front. Now, this is marks will be given for the following. Now, if you look at the bottom, there's a description to say to you what, where you will actually obtain marks. You will obtain marks for the correct shape of the front. You need to label the fronts, the movement of the air, so you need to put in arrows. You can't just say cold air. You need to say, show to us with arrows. Does the air go up? Does the air go down? So if you look at the cold front occlusion, if we look at in uh, behind the, co the, the cold front, there we have an arrow that's pointing downwards to the surface of the earth that tells us OK, that the air is moving down. And then in front of the cold front, we have the warm air that is now in the warm sector. Look there, we have the warm air that moving moves up. But if you look at the cold front section, you will see that there's one arrow that also moves up. Look at the kind of clouds that we have there. That is where our cumulus nimbus clouds come from. OK, you can already see that's the shape of it. It's starting to develop. So ladies and gentlemen, we need to, we need to understand and we need to know that you can draw and put in the correct labels for us. So the wind movement, the clouds we need to. Precipitation, what is precipitation? OK, that is your rain, your dew, your snow, your fog. That's all called precipitation. All right, the temperature you need to say to us. Is it cold air? Is it cool air? Is it warm air? Is it cold air? You need to identify that for us. OK, so that is to make sure that you get the maximum the marks for that. OK, then next one. OK, this one is on page five for you is the same as what we had with the different drawings. Um, I will give you another eight minutes to answer this one for me. So what evidence in the diagram indicates that X is a rapidly deepening low pressure. Oh, now we need to look at the isobars. I'm just giving a so a clue, a little clue, okay? And then 1.32 describe the predicted change in temperature and air pressure that Cape Town will experience, okay? Will experience. Remember. That cold front is approaching Cape Town. So what is the temperature and air pressure that Cape Town will experience? And then account uh, for the cumulus numbers class that will form at Y. There you need to explain. OK, why will we have cumulus numbers clouds at Y? Account means you have to describe, explain to us because you can't just say, oh yeah, isobars are widely spread, um, or oh, yes, we can see, you need to explain to us, okay? I give you eight minutes to answer that quickly for me.
Hi, Mr. Silva. This is Miss Bailey talking from the WCET. You are on mute or are you asking the children to do an activity? I see you trying to make your video come on. No, ma'am, I did not try that. Hello, Miss Bailey. Hi, sir. How are you? I'm very well, ma'am. Excellent. No, no, what I'm doing is when I ask them to do the activity, then I switch off my mic. Ah, OK, cool, sir. Thank you. All right. So okay. is, is Dylan now gone? No, Dylan is still there. I'm still here. Oh, OK. I thought it was a new person taking over. No, sir, not at all. OK. <laughs> OK. Dylan? Yes, sir. I just want to know. I know that uh, the activities are for 12 minutes, but I'm giving eight minutes. Is it possible that the teachers can just indicate if the eight minutes is enough? OK, so we can ask the educators that is in the classroom if they can just indicate um, by either raising their hand or typing it in the comment section. OK. Um, teachers, I just want you to draw the attention of the children to the information that appears at the bottom of the synoptic weather map. Mr. Silva, sir, um, I don't know, can you see on the screen there's this grey block? Can you maybe drag that and move it away, please? Grey block? You're talking about this one? Yes. I can't. I can't move him. Okay, I also can't move it. Okay. Okay, there we go. Well, there is it back at the same place. It is back. Okay. Ah. I guess it's here to stay then. <laughs> yes, it looks like it, eh? Okay. But I think I think um um the, t the children should have these documents in front of them because what we've done, we've sent it to all the schools so that the, t the school can make copies. So they should have this in front of them. It definitely is in the notes package. Yeah, it is in the notes. Can we go for another two minutes? Um, Teachers? One minute to go.
We still have about 30 minutes left. Okay. All right. Let's continue. I still want to get to the tropical cyclone. So your first question that you have there, what evidence in the diagram indicates that X is a rapidly deepening low pressure? Remember that I said you need to look at the isobars and there we go. Your isobars will be closely spaced together. And remember, if your isobars are very closely spaced together, then we have a steep pressure gradient. That means that the wind will blow very strongly, okay? Then station models show high wind speed. There, the last sentence, very strong winds will appear. Okay. Then next question, describe the predicted change in temperature and air pressure that Cape Town will experience. So Cape Town will have a cold front. So we know that there's going to be a, a, a change in the temperature and the air pressure if a cold front arrives. Let's see. Temperature will decrease, it means it will drop. And the air pressure will increase, it will rise. Remember, with a drop in temperature comes an increase with air pressure. Okay, with a decrease in temperature comes an increase in air pressure. Sorry, so it comes with, sorry, sorry. With an increase in temperature comes a decrease in air pressure. Okay, don't forget. Account for the cumulus number scars that we will form at Y. Okay, there's Y indicated to you. So the cold air will undercut the warm air, forcing it to rise rapidly and very high. Steep gradient of the cold front forces air to rise very high, and therefore we will have cumulus number scars. Why have beachgoers been warned to stay away from the beach? So, ladies and gentlemen, winter, cold front is on its way. Here yeah, you are warned. Remember the warning that I spoke of about two years ago, where it was said, please, if you have anything that is laying around in the yard, put it away, put it in the garage, winds are coming, because that, that is where you need to start. What will happen if that cold front reaches? What do we first experience? We first experience the wind speed will pick up. So you need to say something about the wind. What will happen to the air? Okay, cold air will move in. in. So you need to make sure that you understand. I would ask yourself, will you want to be next to the beach? if a cold front moves in. Okay, so we can get um, waves that can move in. I always tell my children, if you go to Sea Point, there's a little garage between Green Point, Green Point and Sea Point, the shell garage on a winter morning when the rain is falling and the weather is so dirmakar, chaos, then the water comes over that wall and it goes into that little shop. What happened in the Strand a couple of years ago, the municipal decided that we're going to put on walls between the road and the beach so that they can prevent the water that coming over the road and go into the people that stay in that um, hotels and that restaurants that we have in the Strand. So come, let's see what kind of answers can we expect here. So there we go. Storm surges, high waves will make the sea rough, dangerous. Okay. Now that is only we concentrate on beachgoers, okay? The coastal areas will be flooded. So, most probably, okay? Possibility of sandstorms. I right know the sand is blowing you. Uh, I don't want to be here. This is, I'm feeling miserable. No, come, let's rather go home. I don't want to be close to it. Strong winds, possibility of thunder and lightning. Hail also, heavy rain, strong possibility of injury or loss of life of people. So you need to go 
We would rather stay at home and say, no, wait, I'm not going to take, uh, go stay on the beach. If there's a possibility that I can injure myself. So therefore, come, let's pack up and let's go. Right, here we go. We don't stay here. Okay, then the next question, 1.5. How can residents of Cape, of Cape, of the Cape, coastal regions reduce the negative impact of the cold front? Now, wait now. Now we need to be careful now we, how we answer this one. Because now we're not referring to the beachgoer. Remember the beachgoer is on the beach. Right? What will the beachgoer do? Because he doesn't want to experience a cold front. So now the residents, remember we stay on the coastal plains or the coastal regions of the Western Cape. So now we, this is now going to be further. You're going to think now bigger, not only the beach goer. So your answers should include the following. First, the residents should stay indoors. Remember that day when I, of that day that I'm talking of? Of stay, that the warning that we got. So they said stay indoors. Seek shelter, don't let people travel. People living in low-lying areas, be careful for that one. You need to move higher ground because there's a possibility of flooding. There's a reason why we say that. But take your homes and go seek shelter on a higher ground. NGOs and shelters can provide homeless people with shelters and blankets. And that is now also our disaster management comes into play here. And remember when we did the tropical cyclone, we asked what strategies can be put in place to make sure that we don't feel the impact of a tropical cyclone. Now, a tropical cyclone is just as dangerous and, mo and most probably more dangerous than a mid-latitude cyclone. But what strategies must be put in place so we can say disaster management, come in, control, move the people away, provide tents to the people, give me medical supplies to the people. Right, sandbags we can put around the houses so that the water does not come in. Uh, redirect the water into a different area instead of bringing it to for flooding in our areas. Okay, electricity is a, um, it's a big problem. So what we can do is say, right, we need to make sure that it's either we're going to say we're going to cut the electricity if it is not good infrastructure because we don't want people to be electrocuted. And Maintain drainage systems. We know how important it is that the drainage systems must be maintained because if anything is in drainage systems and the water can't run away, that is where flooding is happening. Secure boats and vessels in the harbors. Question that I've asked, why don't we allow boats to come into a harbor or leaving a harbor? on a day when a mid-latitude cyclone or the cold front of a mid-latitude cyclone reaches Cape Town. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't think any captain is going to take that up chance to let his boat run into danger if he wants to leave the harbour on a very, very cold winter's wet day, wind that's blowing. No, he's going to say, no, I'm staying here. OK, media, you can make use of media. Um, you guys understand media better than what our, this fossil of teacher understand. Dylan, I just said to you, I'm 32 years in the industry, so I regard myself as a fossil in the education. Having generators on standby because if electricity goes, we need to make sure that we have electricity. And then we need to have evacuation plans. Same idea that we have with the tropical cyclone. Okay. And then, ladies and gentlemen, Describe the changes, okay? So you need to know the plan view of a mid-latitude. This is the plan view, okay? So there we have three weather stations. Um, the weather station that say the maximum or the air temperature of 24 degrees Celsius and the dew point temperature of 15 degrees Celsius, that weather station is in the warm sector. The one that's at 18 and 15, that is in the cold sector. That is in front of the warm front, okay? 24 and 15 is behind the warm front. And then we have the temperatures that say 16 and 14. 
Look at how that circle is or that weather station is colored in. There's not even a space of white in there. Overcast weather conditions. Surely it's going to rain there. Look at the wind speed. Still remember? Each line is equal to 10 knots. So that is 40 knots that we have there, ladies and gentlemen. So that is the weather conditions that we need to know as what, what, what will happen as it moves a cold front or a warm front moves over an area. All right, so there's the warm front on the right hand side. So when a warm front moves over an area, temperature will rise to the maximum, air pressure will drop to the minimum, wind changes from northeast to northwest. Cloud cover will decrease, rainfall will most probably stop. Okay, then next one, cold front. Temperature will drop. Remember what I said? As temperature drop, air pressure will increase. Wind changes from northwest to southwest, cloud cover will increase and heavy rainfall. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm just a little concerned about the time. So it's already nine minutes past four. Teachers, I'm going to leave that over to you to just continue with the um, mid latitude cyclone with the rest of the with, with the uh, with the children because I would like to touch on the uh, wait 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 let me stay here quickly this is a satellite image okay of a cold front look at the arrow the purple arrow point to us the movement of a mid latitude cyclone okay the blue is the cold front the red that is the warm front LP stands for low pressure. And now look at the difference of cloud cover behind the warm front. No clouds or fewer clouds. And if there's no clouds, then it means there can't be any precipitation. Right? They, they say about the wind is northwest, but I just want to point out to the things that you can see immediately. You know, if this is a this is a warm front. Immediately, we know that there's going to be higher temperatures, low clouds, and no precipitation. And then we can later talk about the wind direction, and then we can talk about the pressure because we know high temperatures, low pressure. Okay. Then let's go to the cold front. Yay! Beautiful. Look at the clouds there behind the cold front. Right, lots of clouds, high cloud cover, and we know if there's clouds, there's a possibility that there is going to be rain. 80, 90 percent chance that there is going to be rain. OK, because that's lots of clouds. Definitely there's going to be rain. OK, so that is a satellite image of a mid latitude cyclone. So ladies and gentlemen, Tropical cyclones. What do we need to know about a tropical cyclone? So we need to know what is a tropical cyclone. OK. And the place, where do they start? Where do we find them? What areas of the world do we find them? The stages of development, the same like with the mid-latitude cyclone, also stages. And then the important one, the impact on the environment and people. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this one is very dangerous. Okay, but I come, let's see. How does he work? So the characteristics that you will identify immediately with a tropical cyclone that occurs at the tropics. Further than 50 degrees, let's say between 50 to 8 degrees, away from the equator, so north and south of the equator. Now why? Why is it not starting on the equator? Because the equator does not have Coriolis force. Remember your teacher said that to you? There is no Coriolis force on the equator. Now maybe you should write down Coriolis force and then you can find out what is Coriolis force again? Right, something to do with deflection. I'm not going to give you the answer. I'm just giving like a hint. Deflection. Then 
it is happening in the ocean because a tropical cyclone for him to be a strong guy he needs water he needs wind and he happens we develops over oceans where the water is warm plus minus 26 degrees celsius that is what you need to know he moves from east to west remember we said the mid latitude cyclone move from west to east opposite direction okay but also away from the equator and then he gets to madagascar but now they say the eye okay now in the eye we don't have wind no wind no rain no clouds but the areas immediately next to the, the eye whether it is behind or in front of the eye they are the most dangerous part and especially the part that is in front of the eye he is the most dangerous one he takes away houses cars he destroys crops and then the water he brings the water with him then he floods the land bridges will collapse uh, hurricane katrina that happens in america we had one now recently in um, Mozambique came in on the same island that we have there Madagascar came over Madagascar um, he destroyed lots of vegetation um, Batsarai I think was his name yes Batsarai and I also want to stop with the name Batsarai say to us start with a B telling us that that was the second tropical cyclone over that region for that season because b is the second letter of the alphabet so the next one is going to be katarina okay c that will be the third one and then the next one will be denise or david and they, that's d that's the fourth one remember they get their names as they appear. So number one will have a name starting with A. So then we know that is the first tropical cyclone over that area for that season. Move away from the equator. And it goes over Madagascar. OK, now as it go over Madagascar, it rains, it floods the area, destroy whatever's in its path but also it loses its power because of the friction that we get between the land and the tropical cyclone. So now it loses a little power, but now it goes further and it goes over the uh, Madagascan channel. Now remember that's warm water there. Still remember what current flows past there? The warm, there's the country, Mozambique. The warm Mozambican current flows next to the east coast of South Africa. That currents come from the equator and he brings warm water with it. Remember, this is in the Indian Ocean. The Indian Ocean has got warm water. Right? It reaches Madagascar, loses a little bit of power, comes to the northern part of KwaZulu Natal, brings a little. The rain brings flooding, storm wind, and then it turns around and then it disappears into the ocean again at the 30 degrees south of the equator. Remember, this part of the world is in the south of the equator. You know, if you know your countries, you will know Madagascar, right next to Africa, on the east coast of Africa, next to Mozambique. Okay? And then it disappears, dissipates because it doesn't have any moisture. Okay, so where does the moisture come from? Remember, we say warm ocean. So if there's warm ocean, then it means there will be lots and lots of evaporation, right? And then lots of condensation in that area. But now, 
as it gets to move away from the equator, why doesn't it have any moisture anymore? No more warm air. Okay, it experienced friction. Okay, but now, why? Remember now, now we're closer to the polar regions where the water is cold, right? And that is why it loses its moisture and its warm air, okay? But it turns 30 degrees east. That is also a question that teachers, you can ask them, your children. And come, let's see yeah, if they know this. I know the time is not going to allow us to get to the answer, but remember that the westerly starts at the 30 degrees and is between the 30 degrees and 60 degrees south of the equator. So when a tropical cyclone reaches the 30 degrees south, then the westerly is forcing it from west to east. And the water in the southern part of the Indian Ocean is colder than what we have in the northern part of the uh, Indian Ocean. Okay, or let me say um, we have in the southern hemisphere, we have the northern part of the Indian Ocean that is just south of the equator. And then we have the southern part that is closer to the polar regions of, of the Indian Ocean. And that, that part is colder. The question that I remember one that was asked one year is, why don't we find any tropical cyclones in the Atlantic Ocean or the Southern Atlantic Ocean? Now we are on the west coast of South Africa. Remember now, water or the current that flow past the west coast of South Africa is the cold Benguela. That water comes from the polar regions, cold water, and that is why we won't find any tropical cyclones for development at the, in the Atlantic Ocean. Okay, it's got, okay, before we get there, before we get there, let me just give a little bit more information regarding tropical cyclones, the different names. So what do we need to know? We need to know that it moves from east to west. Where does it form? five to eight uh, degrees Celsius away from the equator. Why? On the equator, there's no uh, Coriolis force. That is why it can't develop on the tropic, uh, on the equator. Then it's over warm ocean water with plus minus 26 degrees Celsius. It moves away from the equator. And then in the eye, no wind, no rain, no clouds. And then it moves over land mass, and as it moves over the land mass, it brings destruction, storm winds, storm winds, and it brings rain, it brings flooding. But in the meantime, also, because of this friction between the tropical cyclone and the land area, that also slows it down a little bit. But Madagascar is not too big, okay? So it doesn't lose a lot of its power. But then it goes over the... Madagascar channel and then it picks up energy again and then when it reaches uh, South Africa and then at the 30 degrees it turns around and then it goes back into the ocean. I just want to share this with you um, boys and girls. Tropical cyclones are categorized. So you get a category one till five. Okay now a category one according to the US Sophia S Simpson system Category one can have um, wind speed of between 70 to 80 kilometers an hour. Category two, between 100 to 110 kilometers an hour. Three, between 150, 140 to 140, oh, 140 to 150 kilometers an hour. A category four, is between 160 to 170 kilometers an hour and a category five sorry sorry ladies and gentlemen i apologize knots we're talking about knots okay and then a category five is 180 knots that is about 330 to 340 kilometers an hour apologies for that 
Okay, that is the, the, the figures that I gave you now was for knots, but a category five um, tropical cyclone has speeds, wind speeds of between 170 to 180 knots. That is equal to 330 to 340 kilometers an hour. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you can work it out for yourself, boys and girls. I don't think any of us would like to be in that in that position. It's got different names around the world. On our side, where we found South Africa, uh, Indian Ocean, that's known as a tropical cyclone. In the Indian Ocean is known as a tropical cyclone. And in the Atlantic uh, and Eastern Pacific, it's known as hurricanes. And then in the Western Pacific Ocean, it's known as typhoons. Okay. Then what is a tropical cyclone? Um, you should know somewhere your teacher say, as I explained to you, a tropical cyclone are intense low pressure cells that forms over warm tropical waters or oceans and has severe weather conditions. Okay. Remember now, if we look at the tropical cyclone, it does not have a front. Okay. The eye. Right. That say to us that that thing is whirly twirly. Okay. He turns. Okay. Then. Lots of evaporation, temperatures also high over the ocean. Also, it appears in late summer, early autumn. Question, why late summer? Why not early summer? Now, the reason is, remember, our summer solstice is only in December. So now the sun arrives here in the southern hemisphere and now it must only warm the water so that we can get that 26 27 degrees celsius so that tropical cyclones can form so that is why we only found them at late summer early autumns okay then it's got the low pressure usually the low pressure the pressure is usually below a thousand millibar or hectopascal OK, I did say away from the equator between five, eight, nine, ten um, degrees south of the equator in our case. Um, and then remember the Coriolis Falls. OK, then the, I don't have, I don't think that you're. Your booklet makes provision for the different stages. Oh, it does. It does make provision for your different stages. Okay. So if you lo look on, if you go to page six, it actually explains to you what. If you go to page six and you go to window number four, okay, the eye is in the middle. You will see at the bottom of that illustration, the eyes in the middle. Now look at the rainfall. Look at the, the graph that we have there for rainfall. That is very low. Look at the wind speed also low. The air pressure is low. The temperature increases in the eye. There it's written there. No wind, no cloud, no rain. Maybe we should add the temperature will increase. Little temperature will increase. OK, then let's look at the areas just right to uh, right next to the eye and now we're looking at the front part that is the if you look at the eye and you go to the part just left from it okay there we have hurricane force winds air pressure drops very heavy rainfall so ladies and gentlemen wind speed i don't think that any of us would like to experience that okay so that front part of the tropical cyclone that is the most dangerous part. Okay, there is a uh, some. Oh, yeah, I see the drawing here at the bottom where they have the different stages of a tropical cyclone. Okay, there. The, if you look at the five stages at the bottom, they have highlighted that part that is very dangerous. That's the front part. Remember, the tropical cyclone. If you look at your page, 
the movements show from right to left. That means from east to west. OK, and also the symbol. If you go to the immature stage of a tropical cyclone, there's the symbol that we will get on a synoptic weather map. Look at the, uh, the, the, the air pressure that we find in 995 or 996. But look at the mature stage. The air pressure, the last, second last isobar is 972. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if we have an air pressure that's so low, then it means from somewhere air must come in to get an equilibrium. That is very low. That means that the isobars will be very close back together. OK, so now air needs to be sucked into that low pressure. So let's look at the formative stages quickly, the first stage. So it's a low pressure that develops on the tropical easterlies. The isobars bend away from the equator, okay, because we know that it will move away from the equator. Then we have the immature stage, right? Pressure drops below 1,000 hectopascal, and the eye starts to develop. Now we give the storm a name, right? And we will say this is the first one, and we say, this first one for our area for this season, that's Amanda. Bay, okay, the storm is indicated. Remember what I said, look at the, in, what are we indicated? So when we go to the synoptic weather map, that will be the symbol that we will use for a synoptic weather map. Okay, and then next one, the winds on our hurricane strength. 150 kilometers an hour, okay? And the size of the eye can be between 30 to 50 kilometers an hour. That is now the immature stage. The mature stage, now, if you look at the picture that you have, mature stage, the pressure is now even lower. Now it reaches at its lowest, lowest point. Now the system is now has reached maturity. Now we have speeds of up to 300 kilometers an hour, uh, 300 kilometers, okay, per hour. Inside the eye, we say no wind, no um, clouds, no rain. Temperature will increase, okay. Low pressure and the, and the fast wind over the ocean cause a storm surge. The worst weather, and this is something that I'm reading now to you, the worst weather is experienced in the front left hand quadrant. That's the most dangerous part. 